everything you want is right here. We gon' give them what they came for. We gon' take it up from last year. Shoot them a shot, boy, I'm long range. Me and the team on the same thing. Stay down, never switched up. Only thing changed was the game. I'm in the zone now. Nothing can change what we on now. When I pull up, know what's going down. Foot on the gas, ain't no slowing down. Aiming for greatness, no settling. Keep down the the Sweet 16 is set, it's locked, and there are four, one, two, three, four Atlantic Coast Conference teams among the 16 teams left in March Madness for 2024. I'm Mike Waddell, he's David Glenn, this is the North Carolina Sports Network, it's our Bacon and Basketball Month of March, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council, and David Heading into March Madness, everybody was thinking, hey, maybe the ACC is a down year. Maybe they won't have any teams make the Sweet 16. And lo and behold, four teams, including three from the 919, are in the Sweet 16. That's amazing stuff. Yeah, Mike, it's something worth celebrating. And, and it really starts with a long-term trend for the Atlantic Coast Conference. I can't even believe this number when I say it out loud. But the ACC... Even before you get to the volume that you just described, with one quarter of the 16 teams still standing from the Atlantic Coast Conference, in terms of consistency, let's just start here. This is the 44th consecutive tournament where the ACC has a presence in the Sweet 16. That's close to a half century where there hasn't been a Sweet 16 held without the ACC. And I like to remind people that the rules were different back in the day. So one way to word it is that since the NCAA eliminated rules where they restricted the number of teams per conference that could make the big dance, for a long time, remember, it was only one team per conference. And then in the 1970s, they made it only two teams per conference. Well, at the end of the 70s, they decided wisely to just remove all restrictions so from 1980 forward, you could have as many teams per conference in the field as those resumes justified. Well, under what we'll call the modern rules, 1980 forward, there's never been an NCAA tournament without the ACC in the Sweet 16. You can call it 45 years in a row, or you can call it 44 tournaments in a row. There was that weird COVID year, so you have to be careful how you word it. But almost a half century where you can't throw a Sweet 16 party unless the Atlantic Coast Conference is invited, that's about as good as it gets. And since you mentioned the 919, I'll hit you with another fun fact. This is only the fifth time in the history of an NCAA tournament that, of course, dates back to the late 1930s, but has had changing eligibility rules over time. This is only the fifth time that UNC and Duke and NC State all made the Sweet 16 in the same year. It happened in 1986. It happened again in 1989. It happened in 2005. It happened in 2015. And now it's happened again in 2024. And when you add Clemson to the mix as ACC number four, it really is a reminder that the ACC had dropped off by some measures in recent years. Remember, if you just go back to last decade, it was Duke winning it all in 2015, and a lot of other teams did well. It was Carolina winning it all in 2017. It was Virginia winning it all in 2019, but that was another really deep year where a lot of other schools also made runs to the Sweet 16 or beyond. Last year, remember, it was only Miami even in the Sweet 16. Now, the Canes did make the Final Four, so that could kind of put a nice bow on the ACC season overall, but we're a lot more familiar with seeing the ACC with four out of the Sweet 16 than what we saw a year ago with nobody from the state of North Carolina and only the, Carol and only the Miami Hurricanes representing the ACC in that Final Four. Uh, one quick thing about the bigger picture that I've seen uh, from many ACC fans. I personally do not believe that just because the ACC is doing well, that means automatically somehow that Pitt should have gotten in or Wake Forest should have gotten in. I really see them as very different conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready to celebrate the ACC, man. I'm ready to throw the party. I'm ready to pop the balloons. 
But Selection Sunday, I like to remind people, is about individual team resumes. UNC was an elite team. Tar Heels were awarded with a number one seed. Duke and Clemson were pretty darn good, but not quite elite. They got rewarded with a four seed and a six seed, respectively. UVA had a bubble-type resume, and the Cavaliers barely got in uh, with that 11 seed before face-planting in that uh, first four game. NC State wasn't even on the Selection Sunday radar, so they just went and grabbed the league's automatic bid with five victories in five days at the ACC tournament in Washington, D.C. But the bottom line to me remains that Pitt had only two outstanding victories all season at Duke and at UVA. They also swept NC State, but that was the NC State team that wouldn't have made the tournament unless they had that run in Washington, D.C. Uh, they played Carolina, Pitt did, but they lost by double digits at home. They played Clemson twice, Pitt did, but they lost both games. They played the Florida Gators, but they lost to Florida. They even played a Missouri team that finished winless 0-18 in the SEC, and the Pitt Panthers lost to those Missouri Tigers. In most years, that stuff's just not going to get it done, no matter what league you're in or how good your league was that season. Similarly, Wake had more quality wins than Pitt, but the Demon Deacons did absolutely nothing away from home. And then they let that bunch of games get away after that big victory over Duke. Again, that's just not going to get it done most years. And I personally don't believe that just because the ACC has proven itself worthy here during March Madness, that changes what the decision should have been on Selection Sunday. The Big East was an even higher rated conference than the ACC this season. They only got three bids. And you know what? Those were the correct decisions. You know how we know? Because UConn is still standing and Marquette is still standing and Creighton is still standing. But as an ACC fan, would you say that just because those three Big East schools have done well, that means St. John's should have gotten in or Providence shouldn't got should have gotten in or somebody else should have gotten in from that middle of the pack in the Big East? I, I just don't connect those same dots the way others do. Uh, so instead of that, let's celebrate what is real. Let's celebrate third-year head coach at UNC, Hubert Davis, who has just gone from overseeing one of the most disappointing seasons in college basketball history one year ago when his preseason number one Tar Heels failed to even make the NCAA tournament in the end. And he just led a number one seed Carolina team past a Hall of Fame caliber coach Tom Izzo to punch the Tar Heels ticket to the Sweet 16. Let's celebrate John Shire, who's only in his second year at Duke and had a disappointing second round exit at last year's NCAA tournament. But he just followed up last year's ACC title for the Blue Devils with his first trip to the Sweet 16 as a head coach, leading a group that seemed to have lost its mojo in that senior night game against Carolina at the end of the regular season and with that early exit at the hands of NC State at the ACC tournament, he's punched his ticket with the Blue Devils to the Sweet 16. Let's also celebrate Brad Brown now, and we'll get each into each of these games and stories individually, but that guy's at a football first school without much of a basketball tradition, relatively speaking, and he's now responsible for two of Clemson's five all-time trips to the Sweet 16. Brad Brownell just took the Tigers past a Baylor team led by a national championship coach in Scott Drew and a Baylor team that has a bunch of highly recruited guys, including some prep All-Americans, far more than the Tigers have ever seen, at least on the basketball court. We do see that in football uh, by the lake down there in South Carolina. And finally, let's celebrate Kevin Keats, who seemed to be fighting for his job at NC State just two weeks ago but now has led the Wolfpack to its first ACC championship since 1987, and it's just its fourth Sweet 16 since the 1980s. And Coach Keats did it with a team that had lost seven of its last nine games in the regular season, but somehow stuck together and now has made this magic happen all the way to the Sweet 16. That is a lot for ACC fans generally or those four fan bases specifically to celebrate especially given that criticism that the ACC took from a lot of the national media uh, for much of this season, but even more broadly uh, over much of these last four seasons. 
That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. When we come back after this timeout, we'll go back and look at the big North Carolina win over Michigan State. That sends them to the Sweet 16 again. The Tar Heels setting records even here in 2024 with another Sweet 16 appearance. We'll talk about North Carolina right after this here on the North Carolina Sports Network. Michael Berard, Managing Director Investments with the Founders Group at Stiefel, works with a select group of high net worth individuals and institutions to develop and implement investment plans tailored to their specific objectives and risk tolerances. If you are interested in highly personalized, well-researched guidance and outstanding personal service, you can contact Michael at 984-364-2002. That's 984-364-2002. Stiefel Nicholas and Company Incorporated, member SIPC and NYSE. The first of the four ACC teams to make the 2024 Sweet 16, the North Carolina Tar Heels, the regular season champions of the Atlantic Coast Conference, the number one seed in the West Regional, and the Tar Heels again beat Michigan State in the NCAA Tournament, David Glenn. Final score 85 to 69, Armando Baycott, 18.17 rebounds. The Tar Heels also, I thought, a very impressive 19 of 23 at the charity strike. That's a place that Carolina has to make shots if they're going to go deep in this tournament. But again, Hubert Davis, as you alluded to earlier, taking his team for the second time in his three seasons to the Sweet 16. Yeah, fun fact right out of the gate. Carolina is now 36-2 and two in NCAA tournament games held in the state of North Carolina. That's the all-time record, of course, including now 14-1 and one in the city of Charlotte. Earning a number one seed can pay off in part with a home court advantage, and it did with the Tar Heels just about two and a half hours by car away from Chapel Hill where they were playing in front of a very Carolina blue crowd at the Spectrum Center in Charlotte. Uh, Michigan State very quickly put the Tar Heels in a 12-point hole. That happened to the Heels at the ACC tournament against Pitt. It happened to them again against NC State when they didn't fully recover. That's a little bit of an alarming trend. But this UNC team, I, I say it this way, and although some Carolina fans don't like comparisons to a year ago, this Carolina team this year has more grit, more toughness, more fiber, more backbone, more resilience through adversity in its pinky finger than last year's UNC team had in its entire locker room. And again, I know some people don't like the references to last year's disaster, but nothing illustrates one of the greatest strengths of this year's Tar Heels better than the contrast with last year's Tar Heels. An early 12-point hole last year in a big game, and there was a lot of worry against Michigan State on Saturday. That may have melted down last year's Tar Heels. Early trash talking by the opponent may have distracted last year's Tar Heels. Early struggles by the Tar Heels may have jolted the Heels' confidence or made them stray from the game plan or try to play hero ball or maybe otherwise forget that the only way to claw back into a game against a good opponent is to boil it down to a possession-by-possession a game in which everyone plays at peak intensity on defense. We rarely saw that last year. We see it regularly this year. And everyone focuses on finding and taking the smartest possible shot on offense. Again, that was rare last year. It's been fairly consistent this year under Hubert Davis. This year's heel, heels did the right things. They didn't panic. They didn't point fingers. They didn't stray from the game plan when they were down 12 and fans were biting their fingernails at Spectrum Center. It started, as you said, with Armando Baycott inside. It continued with R.J. Davis outside. Those have been pretty consistent themes all year for the Tar Heels. And then usually it continues with some combination of Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram on the wings. Those, those guys and their teammates all took smarter shots for most of the game after taking some questionable shots early. And you saw the result. Carolina runs off 17 straight points during a 23-3 to run over the last eight minutes of the first half. That secured, actually, the largest comeback by Carolina in a March Madness game since 2007 
when they were down 16 to Southern Cal before coming back to beat the Trojans in the Sweet 16 back in 07. Carolina was up 40 to 31 by the break against Michigan State, and they really never looked back. And in the end, Michigan State had good guards, but Carolina's guards were even better. Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan were dogs, and I spell that D-A-W-G-S. The Stanford transfer and the Notre Dame transfer, who got tired of the losing they experienced at their previous schools, they compete with intensity on defense, they don't take a possession off, they play with a high basketball IQ that the Tar Heels often lacked last year, and they just don't back down from anybody, any opponent, any situation. Ingram was unbelievable against the Spartans with that fantastic defense, but also aggression going after loose balls. Obviously, his shooting. He finishes with 17 points, seven rebounds, and five out of seven from three-point land, as we've said all year, when either Ryan or Ingram or both get it going from out there. The heels are very hard to beat. They were almost 40% from three-point land. They had Ryan and Ingram and R.J. Davis contributing from beyond the arc. When they do that, there's only a couple teams in the whole country that can beat them. And as we turn the page on this one, Mike, the only major negative that came out of Carolina's win over Michigan State to me was the ongoing concern over the freshman point guard, Elliot Cadeau. He took four three-pointers and he missed all four badly to the point that the Spartans were basically daring him to shoot from the perimeter. He did have four assists and no turnovers, which is a strength of his game and contributed to this win. Carolina had only five turnovers as a team against Sparty, and Cadeau helped make that happen. So he's still contributing to the victory. But he played only 22 minutes. Obviously, Hubert Davis saw what was happening and limited his time out there. I don't know how you feel about it, but the Kenny Smith answer on national TV was let it fly, Elliot Cadeau. You know, the, his, his alternative was your coach should yank you from the game if you stop taking that shot. I personally believe, and I love Kenny Smith, and I respect his basketball track record and all that. I don't think Kenny's answer is the right answer. I think Kenny Smith's answer is, as the kids say, YOLO, you only live once. If Kenny Smith's job depended on him winning that game, I don't think that would be his same answer. There is an answer, and there's a right answer, but Hubert Davis has to cook up that answer. He has to tell Elliot Cadeau how he wants Cadeau to respond when the next opponent defends him that way. And maybe it's take the first one, and if you make it, take the next one. But at some point, if you're 0 for 2 or you're 0 for 3, it's the time of year where you're supposed to top, stop taking three-point shots. Either drive to a favorite shot spot for a mid-range jumper or don't catch the ball in certain places on the perimeter. Get in there at the free throw line and receive the ball there. He can make that 15-foot jump shot. I don't know what the plan is, but there has to be a plan because you can't ask your freshman point guard to improvise once you get to the Sweet 16 and beyond. And obviously, the Tar Heels have a number four seed Alabama waiting for them. The Crimson Tide are a very high-scoring offense, so you'd expect the Heels' defense to show up as it has all season. But they need to get their ducks in a row offensively if they're going to beat the Crimson Tide out in Los Angeles. The Crimson Tide and the Tar Heels will do battle in the second game coming up on Thursday, a 9:39 start on CBS. Now, the second team out of the 919 to qualify for the Sweet 16, Kevin Keats and the ACC champion, North Carolina State Wolfpack. They had to go to overtime to get the best of the Golden Grizzlies of Oakland. Final score there, 79-73. Only the second time this year, David, that D.J. Burns, the big man from Rock Hill, South Carolina, had a double-double. That number surprised me. I thought he would have had more of those over the course of the campaign. But his 24-point and 11-board effort, only his second double-double of the season, the Wolfpack continues to survive in advance. Yeah, I loved Kevin Keats' quote after this one. He said, I think one of the things, if you look back at the seven games we've won in a row, I think everyone has really stepped up in different ways. That's kind of what makes us special. That was his quote after the game. It does start with DJ Burns. He continues to be the sensation sweeping the nation because of his effervescent personality, because of his ballerina-like footwork with that 275 pounds and that soft touch, of course, 
24, 11, as you said, four assists as well. While often going, remember, Mike, against the zone defense of Oakland that DJ Burns and the Wolfpack rarely saw during the regular season and that they had only one day to prepare for between that Thursday win and then the Saturday win. So those one-day preps are always much more difficult than the the three- or four-day preps b- before your first game of an extended weekend. Burns also played 42 minutes. Remember, that's a big guy carrying a lot of weight around. There were plenty of regular season games where DJ Burns only played 22 or 23 minutes. So credit him, 42 minutes is double what I've seen from him in some games because of the overtime against Oakland. Nine for 12 from the field, six or seven from the free throw line. The Wolfpack ended up needing every one of those as the game went to overtime. But Coach Keats's theme was well put. Not only Burns is 24, everybody contributed offensively and defensively. Michael O'Connell had 12 points and played some good defense. Muhammad Diara, DJ Horn, and Casey Marcel all had 11 points. And Marcel played some really good defense. Former UVA guy, that's part of why the Wolfpack signed him in the transfer portal a couple years ago against those Oakland guards, some of whom had become, you know, overnight sensations in their own right. Jack Golke with all of his three pointers. Golke got his 22 points. He got his six three pointers, but he only made six out of 17 threes. That's because Marcel was in his grill. He got help from other guards and sometimes big men uh, coming from closer to the post. That required a high-energy, high-attention-to-detail level of defense that we did not often see from the Wolfpack during the regular season. They prepped for Oakland. They executed against Oakland. They knew their personnel, who the three-point shooters were. They got on those guys. They tried to make fo- Oakland try force Oakland to try to beat them off the bounce rather than just launching threes. And they had to dominate the paint. We knew that all along. They out-rebounded the Golden Grizzlies 46-34. to Diara had 13 boards. Burns had 11, as we mentioned. That was not a possibility the way the Wolfpack was built earlier this season. But with, McCon- with O'Connell at point guard, with Diara as the high minutes power forward, the chemistry has clicked for NC State, obviously, during this, this seven uh seven-game winning streak at this point. Michael O'Connell is a deferential point guard, but that's what this Wolfpack needs. He had eight assists, and when asked to take three-pointers, he hit three out of five. And oh, by the way, this stuff doesn't happen unless chemistry stays strong. Jaden Taylor was basically demoted from the starting lineup, but when they needed him against Oakland, he hit that huge three-pointer in, in overtime. He played his usually strong defense, which was much needed against this Oakland team. Taylor off the bench finished with eight points, three rebounds, two assists, a steal, a blocked shot. It takes a village sometimes to win at this stage of the postseason. Kevin Keats got the full village of Wolfpack players. That top seven fits together better better like puzzle pieces in ways that just was not happening in the regular season. And now the Wolfpack is off to face number two seed Marquette in Dallas, Texas on Friday night. That obviously will be the pack's biggest challenge of this NCAA tournament so far. And a rematch of the 1974 NCAA championship game played in Greensboro and won by the Wolfpack, our mutual friend Shaka Smart, the head coach of the Warriors. Now, back then, it was Al McGuire, which a lot of people may not remember, but we're old and we really remember Al McGuire. We love him to death, except for that one night in 1977 when he made me cry. So that is David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. We have half of our teams from the ACC that are going on to the Sweet 16 previewed for you, North Carolina and NC State. When we come back after this timeout, We'll talk about Duke and Clemson, the third and fourth ACC teams in this 2024 NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament Sweet 16. That's it right here as we're talking bacon and basketball here on the North Carolina Sports Network. If you are anywhere near Wilmington, North Carolina and looking for a little live music, a cold beer, a tangy slushy, a fun crowd, or just a taste of the good life at the beach, Jimmy's Bar in Wrightsville Beach is the place for you. 
located on North Lumina Avenue, just one block from the sand and waves of the Atlantic Ocean, Jimmy's features a full bar with nightly beer and drink specials, and it hosts musical performers almost every day of the year. One more fun fact, Jimmy's annual children's bike drive, which started in 2017, now distributes more than 1,000 bicycles and helmets per year to young people in the Wilmington area and beyond. Jimmy's Bar, your home away from home on Lumina Avenue in Wrightsville Beach. Not one, not two, not three, but four. ACC schools in the Sweet 16. I'm Mike Waddell along with David Glenn. We're talking bacon and basketball right here on the North Carolina Sports Network, proudly presented by our foundational partner, the North Carolina Port Council. And boy, I tell you one thing, if you're looking for the easiest pathway to the Sweet 16 out of the ACC teams, you got to look at Duke. The Blue Devils are really hitting on every cylinder. Now, their quality of opponent may not have been as strong as some others, but still, this team is looking really strong right now. 93-55, the Duke Blue Devils get the win over the Dukes of James Madison, Jared McCain, Eight trays, 30 points. Proctor Roach and Filipowski combined for 47 points, David. And Duke shooting 52% from the field, 50% from behind the arc. When Duke shoots like that, when their guards play in that dominating style, it's really hard to beat John Shire's Blue Devils. Yeah, I'm going to get to Jared McCain in a minute because I think that was the most important development in that Duke win over the Dukes. But fun fact, just out of the gate, since JMU was a 12 seed, and at first glance, you might just consider this an expected walkover by the Blue Devils, but I want to remind folks, Duke beat a James Madison team that had won 14 straight games. That was the longest active winning streak in the entire country. Duke beat a JMU team that was the Sun Belt champion and had been 32-3 and on the season a record matched by only the number one overall seed in this year's big dance, UConn. Duke beat a JMU team that had gone to Michigan State during the regular season's season and beat the Spartans on their home court in East Lansing. And Duke beat a JMU team that had not lost a single basketball game since January 27th, which is almost two full months ago as you and I are having this conversation. So I know the Dukes were only a 12 seed, but Duke deserves a lot of credit for basically squeezing the confidence, the optimism, and the hope out of that very confident opponent pretty much right from the opening tip or soon after it, especially given the Blue Devils' recent struggles in two of their previous three games, that home loss to Carolina on senior night, and then that quarterfinal loss to NC State at the ACC tournament in D.C., But to your point, as you started with Jared McCain, and and understandably so, the most important development of this game for Duke is that the freshman guard, Jared McCain, was the best player on the court. He looked like an NBA lottery pick, which he just might turn out to be, maybe even this year, given that sweet shooting stroke, that beyond his year's poise and maturity, a very high basketball IQ and a lot of other great qualities McCain, who I thought was the ACC's most talented freshman all season, only missed out for the ACC's Freshman of the Year honor that his teammate Kyle Filipowski got a year ago because Notre Dame's point guard Marcus Burton Burton had a much bigger role and thus much bigger statistics, but for a bottom-tier ACC team. Jared McCain got a lot of votes for ACC Freshman of the Year, including mine. He was just a second or third option for the Blue Devils. Much better team, but much different role, and that's why he didn't get the most votes for that award. But when McCain, remember, when I saw him in D.C., he looked off balance and kind of out of sorts at the ACC tournament. He had that freak pregame injury that resulted in the bandage over his eye. He had collided with his teammate Jalen Blakes. And then in the aftermath, he just didn't look like himself against the Wolfpack in that Blue Devils loss. He ends up, of course, absolutely awesome against JMU. 30 points, and remember, 22 of those points were in the first half when this game was basically decided. But when you're 10 for 15 from the field, 8 for 11 from three-point land, Duke has been playing basketball a long time, eight threes, 
are the most of any Duke player ever in an NCAA tournament game. And McCain, who's a great rebounding guard, also had five boards. He's been one of the best rebounding guards in the entire country this season. But it continues. As with the NC State story, all hands on deck. Jeremy Roach, who had played poorly against Carolina on his senior night, who had played poorly against NC State in D.C., he also had a bounce-back game, the senior for the Blue Devils, 15 points, six assists, no turnovers, and he only took two three-pointers, but he made one of the two. Tyrese Proctor was really good, too. What did we say going into this JMU game? The Duke guards had to be better versions of themselves, even in the round of 64. They certainly were that. Proctor had 18 points, five assists. He hit four of his 10 threes. That means all three of Duke's starting guards – had another confidence builder, which is exactly what they needed after that oddball stretch a little bit earlier this month. Remember, the Duke team of most of February and trickling into March, according to the metrics and analytics, was one of the three best teams in the country. It was UConn, number one seed, Houston, number one seed. Both of them are still standing in the Sweet 16. So are these Duke Blue Devils. The question had become, because of those odd back-to-back -back games, which was the real Duke? The one that looked like, a, a, looked like those two number one seeds or mm -hmm. the ones that lost to the Tar Heels, lost to the Wolfpack? Wolfpack. The Blue Devils, we know all along, have been absolutely legit offensively. And when their chemistry is right, which looks to be the case again, that starting five is really, really good. Maybe one of the best starting fives in the entire country. I'd say the Devils' depth remains a question. The Devils' defense sometimes remains a question. But the offense that showed up against JMU gives them a chance against absolutely anyone in this field. And that includes the number one seed, Houston, uh, led by North Carolina native Kelvin Sampson, by the way. Uh, who will be waiting in Dallas, Texas, for the Blue Devils on Friday night in the Sweet 16. That game, a 9-39 start on CBS. All four of the ACC games are the CBS games going at 7.09 and 9.39, respectively, on Thursday and Friday night. So good appointment television for Commissioner Jim Phillips, who only has to sit back and just watch one channel, which would be WBTV, there in Charlotte. Our fourth and final ACC team to make the Sweet 16 is maybe the most improbable based on how they played in Washington, D.C. at the ACC tournament. We're talking about the Clemson Tigers, who needed some luck down the straight. You just got a feeling that they were going to tiger it up at the end, kind of like what they did, really similar to what they did at Cameron Indoor Stadium in the regular season loss to Duke, which they snapped from the jaws of victory, but this one, 72-64, they best the Baylor Bears. P.J. Hall fouling out with 36 seconds left, David. The Tigers, though, make their free throws and get some stops. They did not do that over the majority of the final four minutes of this game. It was 61-46 Clemson with 644 left to go in the second half, and with 59 seconds left, it was 66-63. Man, if it wasn't for Chase Hunter truly balling out for Brad Brownell, the Tigers would be back on their way to campus right now singing the blues about what could have, should have been. But instead, they now advance on to the Sweet 16. Well, remember on the football side where Clemson is more famous, that Dabo Sweeney guy made everybody retire the phrase Clemsoning because there had been a stretch of more than a decade where Clemsoning meant losing a game that you were supposed to win on the gridiron. So maybe Brad Brownell is on to something here on the basketball side, because I have seen the Tigers give away the games as you described, but they certainly gutted it out in the end against a, against a really talented Baylor team. Fun fact, uh, and this is just a tip of the cap to Brad Brownell, one thing I mentioned earlier, but this is – only Clemson's fifth trip to the Sweet 16. I mean, some of these other schools have been there a lot. In the history of Clemson basketball, this is trip number five to the Sweet 16. And Brad Brownell, a guy who sometimes does not get a lot of respect from significant chunks of the Tigers' own fan base, is now responsible for two of those five trips 
to the regional semifinals. The Tigers also went to Sweet 16 in 2018 under Brownell, and they did it without an All-American player, without a future NBA lottery pick, without a boatload of prep All-Americans. The guy has a lot of respect, Brad Brownell, around the ACC, I know, for his coaching ability. It is just not easy to get a lot of prep stars to Clemson, South Carolina, to play at a so-called football school for a basketball team that has been in the ACC for 71 years now, but has still never won a single ACC championship. Under those circumstances, I'd argue that Brad Brownell deserves a lot more credit than complaints for what he has accomplished during his 14 seasons with the Tigers, when he's often been going up against teams with a lot more tradition, a lot more high school talent, especially before we got to this new world where name image likeness is in play and you can tap into immediately eligible transfers, for example, the way four-year Joe Girard from Syracuse uh, jumped to that other shade of orange and now plays for these Clemson Tigers. Let's also point out, and you implied this, that UNC was supposed to beat Michigan State, a number nine seed. Duke was supposed to beat James Madison, a very impressive team, but also a 12 seed. NC State was actually supposed to beat Oakland. I mean, the pack is a lower seed, but Oakland's a 14 seed. Clemson was not supposed to beat Baylor, a number three seed coached by Scott Drew, who's been there for more than 20 years as the school's all-time leader in victories, has a national championship under his belt, and sometimes recruits at a level that's a little bit closer to the Duke and Carolina of the ACC genre uh, than what Clemson has been historically on the hard court. The most surprising aspect of the Tigers' win over Baylor to me is not that they won the game. It was easy to forget because the Tigers finished only tied for fifth in the ACC standings, and they lost three of their last four games prior to the start of the NCAA tournament. And included in that was, remember, an embarrassing loss at Notre Dame and an even more embarrassing 21-point loss against Boston College at the ACC tournament. But easy to forget, Clemson had some of the best non-conference victories in the entire ACC this season. The Tigers beat Alabama, still standing, at Alabama. They beat Boise State, another NCAA tournament team, by 17 points. They beat rival South Carolina, another NCAA tournament team, at Little John. They beat TCU, another NCAA tournament team, and well coached by Jamie Dixon on a neutral court. The Tigers also swept the Pitt Panthers. They beat those North Carolina Tar Heels, remember, in Chapel Hill, the only two Times that's ever happened, also both under Brad Brownell as the leader of the Clemson Tigers. It was not the win over Baylor that surprised me. It was some of the details behind the win. First, remember, Baylor was one of the most efficient offensive teams in the entire country this season. Clemson held the Bears to only 64 points. Baylor was one of the best three-point shooting teams in the entire nation this season. About 40% as a team, which is about as good as it gets, top five nationally. Clemson held the Bears to 6 of 24 from long range. That's 25%. That's about as good as it gets defensively. Baylor has really quick, really athletic guards. And as much as I've liked this Clemson team all season, I would not say that the Tigers, who often play with three forwards and two guards, I wouldn't say this Tigers team is built in a way that makes it easy for them to shut down quick athletic guards, but that is exactly what they did, despite the fact that the Tigers were not a great team on defense in ACC play, for example, for most of the season. Far more often, it was the Tigers' offense that put them over the top. They were the second-best offense in conference play behind only the Duke Blue Devils, they usually did it with senior forward P.J. Hall, sharpshooting fifth-year guard Joe Girard, formerly of Syracuse again, leading the way. Not so much this time. Fifth-year senior guard, and this is the other surprising element to me. You mentioned his name earlier. The fifth-year senior point guard, Chase Hunter, who had been truly horrible in a couple of the Tigers' recent losses, was absolutely sensational for the most part against Baylor. Give that young man a lot of credit for coming through at the exactly perfect time. He had a team-high 20 points, a team-high six assists, a team-high three three-pointers, and a team-high two steals. He also made seven of his eight free throws, when, including some clutch ones 
when things were getting a little nerve wracking down the stretch and Baylor had turned it into a nail biter late. P.J. Hall had only 11 points in this game. That's the Tigers' first team All-ACC player. But Clemson is going to the Sweet 16 anyway. Joe Girard hit only one of his five threes. That's one of the most important elements to everything that Clemson does. But Clemson is going to the Sweet 16 anyway. This was an unlikely script, Mike, but it was a script with a beautiful ending for the Tigers. And now Clemson gets to join the Tar Heels out in Los Angeles. Number two seed Arizona, a much shorter trip, obviously, for those Wildcats, are awaiting. And that group includes former UNC guard Caleb Love uh, in that matchup. I want to remind folks, NCAA tournament bracket rules try to prevent members of the same league having to face each other early in the bracket. And remember that with both Clemson and Carolina out in L.A. and with both NC State and Duke in Dallas, the the main reason they're not facing each other is that NCAA tournament bracket rule, which – doesn't often come into play, but they try to build the bracket so you can't face each other until the Elite Eight. Well, sure enough, with four ACC teams still standing, if somehow all four won again on this coming Thursday and Friday, guess what, man? We'd have Duke against NC State in one quadrant of the bracket, and we'd have Clemson against UNC in another quadrant of the bracket. I'm celebrating the history those four teams have already made. But wouldn't that be one cap for the uh, feather in the cap of the Atlantic Coast Conference if somehow this amazing streak of success can continue for just a couple more days later this week? I'm thinking about putting the parlay down that Clemson and NC State battle for the national championship. And Woo. I can hit that along with some over under and some other. Uh, pro- I might never see you again if you win that one. <laughs> You're never going to see me again. I-, I play the lottery all the time, but I was just thinking about that. Legalized sports betting happens the week of the ACC tournament where NC State breaks a 37 year streak and they win the championship. How many of these NC State fans are just dialing up? Because every other commercial that you see on television is for some type of betting organization. The, the Wolfpack faithful, man, they didn't have that in 1983. <laughs> and, and I don't know how many of them would have been betting on Jimmy V to survive in advance and all this, because I don't think that they were really thinking they were going to get past Ralph Sampson out in Utah. But but this is a this is a fun time. It really is. And when you look at this, let's recap now the, the four games involving the ACC teams. First, on Thursday night. It'll be Clemson, the sixth seed against two seed Arizona. This at crypto.com arena 709 CBS for the Wildcats and the Tigers. So that'll be really fun right there. One way or another, a big cat is going to make it to the Elite Eight. And then North Carolina and Alabama come through in the 1 4 game. That's a 9 39 start. And for Tar Heel fans, I know they're going to be thinking about this. There's a guy from Pittsburgh who plays right now for the Crimson Tide, who was supposed to be coming to Carolina next year. He reclassified, and now that young man is going to be playing against the Tar Heels in a very big game for the Crimson Tide and the Light Blue. Then on Friday, it'll be NC State and Marquette, an 11-2 matchup at 7.09 on CBS, and then the nightcap at 9.39, Duke, the fourth seed against top seed Houston, right there in the Lone Star State, 9.39 9.39 again on CBS. David, we'll come back to you later this week, and we'll get your previews of all of these four games. But I guess to put a cap on it, man, what a way to start out the week thinking about ACC basketball alive and thriving here in the month of March. No doubt about it. I had somebody taking shots at the ACC somehow through me on Twitter, and I had to remind them the only thing that's been missing lately, Mike, is national championships. And you don't have to have a long memory to run, to remember the national titles, right? Again, it was Duke in 2015, Carolina in 2017, Virginia in 2019. But even though the ACC hasn't won a national title since 2019, I mean, it's not a massive drought, right? It's only five years. I do like to remind people that the league historically that has won the highest percentage of NCAA tournament games is by far the Atlantic Coast Conference. 
This league has won almost two-thirds of its games in the big dance historically. So I was asked, well, you know, I showed some 10-year numbers and some 20-year numbers, and they were like, show me some, yeah, what have you done for me lately? Show me the last five years. You know what the ACC's number is? Thanks in part to this year, the ACC's winning percentage over the last five, I'll say the last five tournaments, because there was no tournament in 2020, it's roughly two-thirds. I mean, so, again, the only thing missing, there have, we're not missing Final Fours. Miami was there last year. Duke and Carolina made up half the Final Four the year before that. So, no, there hasn't been a cutting down the nets since 2019. But whether you want to look at a five-year picture, a 10-year picture, a 20-year picture, a 40-year picture, folks, it starts with the Atlantic Coast Conference, period. And if you need receipts, go to ncsportsnetwork.com, where I write it all about it all the time, or follow us on our Twitter, on our uh, YouTube channel, uh, where we thank March Madness folks because Mike, you helped get the North Carolina Sports Network channel up and running. We really started to populate it last maybe September, so it was you know a thousand plus subscribers within our first handful of months. We've gotten feels like a thousand subscribers just during our March Madness coverage. So thanks for getting the ball rolling to you, and thanks to these viewers and followers and listeners, whether they're at David Glenn Show on Twitter or at the NC Sportsnet on Twitter or viewers here on YouTube. Remember, we're a small family-owned business. We we don't have we don't have any corporate uh, monstrosity behind us. So every subscription matters to us. We keep trying to deliver great video content, great podcast audio content, and I still write a lot of old-fashioned articles at the website, ncsportsnetwork.com. So we're excited about what's been happening, and to be candid in this sports legal sports gambling world or otherwise, if you've been watching and listening to our previews, you maximize your chance of getting these games right. Because whereas the national media may be surprised that the ACC is making up 25% of the Sweet 16, uh, the folks that have been following them all year for the North Carolina Sports Network, we're not really surprised at all. We haven't gotten every game right, but we told you to expect three or more Sweet 16 teams from this league. And here we are with four still standing. That's about as good as it gets for any league this year. And that's after multiple seasons where the ACC has been getting more criticism than, has, than it has been propped up. Always remember, it doesn't matter what team number 12 or team number 14 or team number 9 looks like. What matters is how many can you get into the big dance and how good are those teams once they get there. By those standards, five bids is not a great look for the ACC now that it's a 15-team league. But by the most important measuring stick, four of those five teams have done as well as you can do so far. And that's a big win for the Atlantic Coast Conference no matter how you look at it. And three men's teams making the Sweet 16 out of the triangle. The Duke women, Kara Lawson, the head coach of the Blue Devils, they go into Columbus and get the win over the two-seed Ohio State Buckeyes. The Duke's women are off to the women's Sweet 16. And later on today at Reynolds Coliseum at 4 o'clock, it'll be Wes Moore and the Wolfpack women against the former head coach of NC State, Kelly Harper, now coaching her alma mater of Tennessee. And that game will determine yet another trip to the Sweet 16. Hopefully five out of the six possibilities. Duke and NC State with both their men and their women making the Final Four would be a great story that we could talk more about later this week. But for now, for David Glenn, I'm Mike Waddell. What a weekend for the Atlantic Coast Conference. And you heard about it all right here on Bacon and Basketball and the North Carolina Sports Network. is right here we gonna give them what they came for we gonna take it up from last year shoot them a shot boy i'm long range me and the team on the same thing stay down never switched up only thing changed was the game i'm in the zone now nothing can change what we on now when i pull up know what's going down foot on the gas ain't no slowing down aiming for greatness no settling kick down the doors they won't let me in